Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Waste Not, Want Not webinar. Um, I'm Lauren Freed, and I'm co-leading this initiative with Charlene Seidel. This is the first in a series of webinars designed specifically for food system funders, but open to the wider JFN audience. Following the beginnings of this group at the JFN conference in Israel two years ago, and then the successful pre-conference symposium held at Urban Adamine March, we are responding to requests from members to learn more on food system topics. And there's no better place to start than with the very pressing issues around food waste and food rescue. We are therefore delighted to present this wonderful panel of speakers and privileged to welcome Mitchell Davis as our moderator. Mitchell is Chief of Strategy at the James Beard Foundation and driving the organization's vision towards positive policy change that supports people, communities, and the planet. We hope you will be inspired hearing from these field experts. And now over to you, Mitchell. Thank you. Thank you, Lauren, and thank you all for giving me the opportunity to help moderate um, what I'm sure is going to be a fascinating conversation. Um, the, our order, our agenda will be a, a brief um, introduction to some of the statistics and the importance of food waste and why we are looking as a global community to reduce it, but also the opportunities that dealing with waste provides um, at different um, inflection points throughout the food system and in the larger philanthropic world. And then we'll hear from three esteemed panelists, each with a distinct um, perspective. And we're going to try, as much as the technology allows us, to have a conversation across uh, two continents and a large ocean. And um, as, as Tamara and Laura, Lauren said, um, please feel free to ask questions as they arise. Um, I will either weave them into our conversation or we'll, we'll save a few minutes at the end to get to questions that don't naturally flow. So uh, I thought I would just start with a few basic um, statistics about uh, food waste in the global space, and then we'll introduce our panelists and, um, and get right into the meat of this conversation. For those of you who don't know, globally, depending on how you count it, some 30 to 40 percent of all food produced um, is lost or wasted at some point in the food system. Some of this will occur no matter what we do. It's just natural organic matter that ends up uh, not being consumed. But a lot of it, um, it can be repurposed, recycled, uh, prevented um, from ending up um, in the waste bin, so to speak. Um, whether we're talking about the developing world or the developed world, the waste happens at a different place along the chain. Um, generally, in the developing world, uh, before a retail or consumer has uh, come into contact with the food, much is lost there. And in fact, that is referred to as food lost more, more um, colloquially. And then um, in the developed world, and of course, these are, are um, generalizations which may or may not apply to specific situations, but in the developed world, most of that waste happens post-consumer. So either at the point of retail or in the fridge or um, some other point in the, in the chain. And that is what we talk about in the, in the jargon of the industry as food waste. So we're dealing with loss and waste, but whichever we're talking about, about 30%, 30 to 40% is lost in the whole process of producing and consuming food. Of course, the, the reason to try to prevent um, this waste, um, are there are many. Um, there's a global push at the moment for environmental reasons. What you may or may not know is that, that wasted food and organic matter in general contributes a tremendous amount of the climate change gases, greenhouse gases, whether it's carbon dioxide, methane, nitrous oxide, or or fluorocarbons from restoration, um, as much as 8% of all global greenhouse gases comes from food waste. So there's a, a strong environmental imperative to stop that. But then there are many other reasons that um, our speakers today will talk about um, as sort of motivations and uh, inspirations, really. Um, um, it, it's no surprise to this audience, perhaps, that 820 million people globally are considered food insecure. That means that they don't necessarily know where their next meal is coming from. Uh, many of those people, as much as uh, three quarters, actually work in the food sector. So um, farming, producing um, some aspect, um, which seems morally um, unsustainable, let's say. Um, but then just within the United States, 40 million or so people, depending on, again, how what data you use, 
are food insecure. So, so no matter where we are in the chain, there is the question of whether or not we, we can waste food when we know that so many people uh, do not know where their next meal is coming from. There are other, uh, other opportunities, whether they're economic, whether they're resource oriented, whether we're talking about saving water, whether we're talking about recovering meals to feed those who are insecure. Um, there are some, some global efforts that I think um, can provide a lot more information. And certainly our experts um, with us today will provide some more insight into, into the system. I would direct you and we'll send around these resources to everybody afterwards to um, what is called the ReFed Report, which is a, an American sort of multi-stakeholder organization that has has done a tremendous amount of research into preventing food waste and the reasons for that, the economic, the environmental, the moral, the, um, um, well, just a, a tremendous amount of, of uh, information there at refed.org. Um, but also the FAO generates a tremendous amount of data globally. Um, and we'll hear from some of our panelists about that. And then um, we'll look to a few other resources that will, I'm sure will come up in the course of our conversation. Uh, a tiny bit of what, why I'm here at the James Beard Foundation, one of our prime um, functions is to reduce, to use, to harness the professional chef and restaurant community to help reduce waste. Um, one of the sites that waste occurs is obviously in the commercial food service industry, um, and chefs are both inspired by the creativity that, that dealing with waste poses, but also the economic imperatives, the environmental imperatives, and all of that, and we've created some resources that we can discuss later. That's enough from me, and again, if you have any questions specific to the topic and the statistics, um, what we're counting and how we're counting, please feel free to ask them. You can click on that icon at the bottom of your screen with the Q&A and they'll come up and we'll include them. But um, you're really here to listen to our esteemed panelists. And so um, without further ado, I will give um, the, the, I'll introduce them and then we will start a, a, a more broad conversation about what their unique perspectives are um, on this whole issue and where there are opportunities to really affect change. Um, we'll begin simply alphabetically with Michal Bitterman, who is the CEO and co-founder of The Natural Step, um, which is a um, sustainability transition food lab is how they describe it. So uh, again, like Refed or some of the other organizations, a stakeholder collaboration that, that works across the entire ecosystem of food production, um, includes producers, distributors, farmers, chefs, et cetera. The Natural Step, you can find out more at that link. And so I'll just say uh, a wave hello from Michal. Hello. And there you are. Um, next, we have with us Lisa Moon, who's the president and chief executive officer of the Global Food Banking Network, um, with a long background in uh, policy and food uh, system work. Um, uh, Lisa, I should say, um, it works at this international nonprofit, which is is trying to address a hunger-free future, create a hunger-free future for more than 30 countries. Again, looking at uh, sustaining and strengthening food banks. Um, Food waste is obviously, uh, as I said earlier, um, uh, and there's a moral imperative for food insecurity to do something with that waste. And um, the food banking system is vast and um, a key part in preventing um, food waste from going literally to waste into landfill. So we'll just to get away from Lisa Moon, um, if you will. Hi, thanks, a nod. And finally, Aviva Paley, who's the senior director and co-founder of Kitchens for Good, which is based in San Diego. Um, it's an entrepreneurial, um, really, project, I think, that's trying to bridge the gap between uh, wasted food and hunger, again, um, in the food bank model, rescuing surplus and imperfect food from wholesalers and farmers, and engaging with students in culinary uh, apprenticeship programs to transform those um, ingredients that they receive into meals for vulnerable populations. So three different perspectives, three different geographic areas, three um, slightly different nodes of the system. And I want to start perhaps, <laughs> excuse me, just because of your background um, in food policy and your sort of broad work, Lisa, with a question to you to, to describe the landscape at this moment. I gave some general statistics, but, but from your perspective and your experience, um, uh, what is the reason that people should be concerned with minimizing food waste, would you say? Well, first of all, Mitchell, thank you so much for having me into the Jewish Funders Network. It's such a pleasure to be here, and I look forward to learning from the other panelists in this um, very rich conversation that we're going to have. I mean, Mitchell, your opening remarks, I think, really set the scene very well, that we as a global community are facing this problem that affects every country, 
where we are either losing or throwing away about a third of all the food that is produced for human consumption. But at the same time, we have one in nine people that struggle daily to access enough food to even meet their basic needs. Um, and you, of course, highlighted the American statistic that we have one in five children in this country that go to bed hungry um, in spite of this enormous amount of surplus. And I think from a policy perspective, you've seen a lot of investment in thinking about how do we make sure as our world becomes much more populous and urban that we're going to be able to produce enough food to meet basic needs. Um, but I think where we're missing in the wider discussion is how do we solve this access gap? How do we make sure that the food that is being produced is accessible to people that need it most? Um, you know, because if we were able just to redistribute 20% of the food that goes to waste every year, we could virtually solve the problem of world hunger. And I think both in the United States and globally, we have a number of policy incentives set up that makes it cheaper and easier to throw food away than it does to redistribute it and make sure it can get to people facing hunger. And the second piece I absolutely think is the environmental piece. I mean, if food waste were a nation, it would have the same amount of greenhouse gas emissions as China. Um, no, no disrespect to China. But it's this very right. significant part of thinking about our world as it becomes more populous and we're demanding different types of food, how are we gonna make sure that our, our globe is gonna be able to accommodate that? So I think there's a role for philanthropy, there's certainly a role for business, um, and we also have to think about the policy incentives that we're setting up. Hmm. So I, I think it's important to just underscore those two points uh, because they are such good context setters for us. Um, so we people often hear, oh my God, how are we going to feed everybody? There isn't enough food. And we know that there's close to a billion people are hungry. But one of the things that you're saying is that we actually do produce enough food. People just can't get to it or it doesn't get to them, let's say, right, for all sorts of reasons. And also that there is uh, an imperative to, to do something about it for the environmental reasons. That's a, a startling statistic, I think, that, that China would uh, produce as much greenhouse gas emission as the food that we waste collectively. Okay, so I'm, taking off from there, I'm going to ask Aviva to insert uh, your perspective into uh, and, and what, you, what you and your organization, but also what you think the, the system can do from your perspective to help address this important issue. Certainly. Thanks for having me. Um, so I think that um, Lisa's bringing up some really important points. Um, but I think we need to also recognize that even if we distribute all of the surplus food, um, people are still hungry the next day. And so we really have to just acknowledge that the root cause of hunger is poverty and lack of economic opportunity. And so really looking at how can we not only feed the food line, but shorten the line itself to help lift people up out of poverty so that they're not needing that food assistance in the first place. And I think that food waste um, or food that would otherwise go to waste can really play a role in empowering individuals to um, become employed and self-sufficient. So that's what we do here at Kitchens for Good is using food waste as that tool to train men and women who are coming out of incarceration, homelessness, and foster care to launch their careers. Um, I think in terms of food waste globally, and especially in the US, the food banks are doing such a phenomenal job at redistributing food and connecting grocers, food producers to the local agencies. But I think where there, um, where there's this need and where there's a lot of organizations stepping up to help is in that food processing. Because if you are a child or a senior or a working mom and you get a bag of mixed match groceries um, of canned tuna, cabbage, and peanut butter, it can be really challenging to turn that produce into a healthy meal. Um, and so having um, partnerships in local communities, kitchens that are taking a lot of that surplus produce and turning it into meals is really critical to meet the needs of clients, but also make sure that a lot of this product ending up at food banks doesn't go to waste. Because a lot of the product by the time it gets to food banks is in the end of its shelf life. And so, you know, if it only has these tomatoes have two more days before they're going bad, making sure that there's a uh, partnership so that things can be processed and not just distributed as well. Thank you. That's a perfect segue, I think, into Mahal, um, who is working across um, the entire spectrum of multi-stakeholder approach. So could you talk about the, why that is needed to address some of the issues that we've just heard about and what's unique about um, working with partners in this field? 
Yeah, thank you. So hello, everyone. Uh, we're looking from the upstream level, and we saw that when we looked at the numbers already six years ago, when we started dealing with this sub subject, we said it couldn't be that a system is throwing away one third of what it produces. It's, it means that the system is broken. Something is wrong in the system that you need at the end of the pipe to find so much solutions. And then when we look, we talked about the economic issue, the environmental and the social, I would like just to add before I'm addressing what we have been doing, that there is also the end consumer level of economic loss. We are spending a lot, a lot of money in uh, times of crisis that the individual partner is, you know, is on his very everyday life uh, facing that we can uh, really reduce uh, when we minimize the cost. There is also a lot of environmental issues beside the greenhouse gases that are starting to be burning issues in many, many countries and the social uh, security and all of that. So when we saw the numbers, we said, okay, we need to see where in, in all the line of the system, the system is broken. And that's why we decided to bring the whole system inside the room and see, first of all, where the loss is in the system. And second, where are the conflicts of interest? Because let's face it, there must be conflicts of interest if the, if the problem is such a huge problem and still the system is working that way. So we decided to take everyone from the ministries to the business, to the social community and the, or the different organizations. And we mapped 10 different types of organizations that should be inside, like you said, the retailers and the farmers and the ministries and the local municipalities and business and academia and so on, and to see how they address the problem. And we saw that the issue of food waste is all over the chain. From the minute that we produce the food till the minute that it gets to our house, there are many reasons that we waste the food. And in order to really promote a systematic approach that will change the system and not just the end of the pipe solution, we need to find a lot of solutions all in, in all the lines. So we talked about saving of food that was addressed already. We try to see in our system how we are preventing the food from even being, you know, being at the phase that it needs to be saved. So how do we prevent it from being at a situation that if it's not saved, it is lost? And this is, we can address afterwards what kind of things we found in our lab, which we did with more than 40 partners from all the different sectors and address what kind of solutions we find. And they're not unique to Israel. They are overlapping, I think, to the whole world. Hmm. Fascinating. Let's uh, a, a couple uh, of a couple of times. I think we were trying to shy away from the notion of waste, which is not the most market positive word. Let's say so. Feeding people who are food insecure waste is not anything anyone would take pride in. And I'm wondering if we can talk about um, whether there are social stigmas about waste uh, in addition to the um, the system that produces it um, that we need to address to address the issue um, and. Uh, across the whole spectrum. I mean, as someone, I, I'm an avid cook and I know that there's some fun in, in using everything in my fridge before it goes away. It's a personal challenge of mine that sometimes I feel some anxiety myself about. But, but um, is, are there terms that people should be familiar with that we should be using that I think are, that would be helpful to solving the problem? Any, anyone, please answer. If I may jump in, I sure. can say that in one interview that I had, we had, a, we had this, uh, we have an event that we called Mass, Massa, uh, which is taking things that were about to be thrown, not in the garbage, were not thrown, but about to be thrown for no reason. And we're making with uh, chefs, you know, this very sexy and unique uh, and very big, uh, you know, um, meals. And they come, it's a surprise. They don't know what they eat. And then after they say it was very successful and they had a really good time and very wonderful evening, we tell them where it came from. And I remember one interview, I was telling about this and the interviewer was all fascinating. He said, wow, it's amazing. And in the end of the interview, when, you know, when the camera wasn't on, she said, oh yeah, this is so gross. And I told her, what is gross? So I think that exactly what you say, when we say waste, people exactly think about, you know, the garbage and garbage. Someone from the garbage. We need to talk about redundancy. We don't need to talk about waste. We need to talk about good things that were not about, you know, that weren't about to be wasted and why. And that, that's our let perspective. Me, that. Let me throw that question back to Lisa, who you've worked in so many different areas. Um, yeah, please. 
<laughs> yeah. So we tend to use the term food loss uh, just because that seems has less of, less of a stigma than waste. And the other term that we talk about a lot is surplus. And I think, especially when you're talking to people located in, you know, Western countries and the like, uh, you know, look, we have a huge surplus issue because we all, you know, want to be going to the grocery store 12 months a year and purchasing blueberries, no matter if they're in season or not, right? So, um, so retailers, I, I think, you know, there's constantly going to be surplus there because they're trying to meet consumer demand and we're very demanding consumers in, in, in these places in the world. So we talk a lot about wholesome edible surplus, a lot about reducing food losses. Um, and, you know, it was so interesting in France a couple of years ago, uh, a grocery store uh, there called Intermarché did a whole series on what they called inglorious fruits and vegetables, where they promoted kind of the food that wasn't cosmetically perfect for sale. And they ended up turning it into all of these really creative, tasty dishes that consumers love, whether it be smoothies or soups or whatever. And they sold it and they did a whole PR campaign around it. And that was really the first domino in France in terms of completely transforming how people viewed surplus food. Mm -hmm. Ultimately, of course, was a key role in this law that was passed a couple of years ago that prohibits grocery stores from throwing food away. So I do think it's possible to have a dialogue change. But, you know, Mitchell, it's people like yourselves and the other people on this call call that are really reframing how we talk about um, this waste issue, that it's really wholesome edible surplus. Surplus, I think, is a, is a very useful word. Any thoughts about um, this conversation, Aviva? Yeah, I think that we're sharing really similar um, challenge and how to brand food that would otherwise go to waste, surplus, cosmetically imperfect. Um, I've heard many terms thrown around. And I think it's really focusing on the fact that this is perfectly edible and nutritious product. Um, for example, we pick up all of the leftover produce from five um, high-end farmers markets every Sunday that these farmers don't sell. What was being sold top dollar to yuppies like me five minutes ago is now being donated. Um, is that waste um, as you would typically consider in your trash can? No. Um, and so it's really, I think, part of this work in systems level is really around the rebranding of it as well um, and doing a lot of advocacy and awareness campaigns around it so that we're really aware of where the surplus is and how each consumer can also play a part in that in that uh, reduction of food waste as well. I wonder, thank you for that, I wonder if we could think about um, three segments along the chain of production. So whether it's producing, distributing, and somehow processing food to the retail aspect and then to consuming um, in restaurants or uh, shopping at home. And if, if I could ask you to think about some interventions along that, those three major groups that um, whether from business, whether we're talking structural or even perhaps policy, those of you who are more familiar with policy, um, that you see opportunities for change that would help um, the waste issue. Um, I realize some of those are we would call sometimes up chain, think, thinking about the supply chain, um, which ends in the landfill, let's say. But but um, where where might there be interventions to happen uh, um, in those three major um, sections? And let's talk about the developed world for now. Um, if I could, who, who might want to go first? I, Lisa, you're nodding um, enthusiastically. <laughs> I am. It's a very good question, Mitchell. <laughs> um, I don't know if I can come up with three, but I, I do want to flag two. Um, and uh, and just everyone is clear in my perspective on the call. Of course, I'm really looking at the portion of the supply chain that's the wholesome edible surplus kind of happening at scale and how we are recovering that and distributing it through social service agencies at the community level. Um, so, so definitely... Uh, for better or for worse, food and agriculture sector is is it's a it's a business. It's a it's, it's you know a private sector driven industry. And like you even mentioned, Mitchell, that um, one of the saddest ironies is that a significant number of that 820 million people facing hunger are actually farmers or working somewhere in agriculture, struggling to even meet their basic needs. But um, so you really have to, you know, we have seen great success in bringing the private sector to the table. And I think if you could see the very large um, food manufacturers um, and the retailers making the commitment that once their once their food that is wholesome and edible becomes unsaleable for whatever reason, if they would commit to donating that product um, 
uh, globally, both in higher income countries and lower income countries, I think you would see a significant um, a, a significant reduction in that food loss. Obviously, prevention first and foremost is what we have to focus on. But then, if you can't prevent it, um, you know, uh, uh, making commitment to to do those donations, and that kind of leads me to my second suggestion around policy incentives. In many places, it's, it's cheaper and there's less legal liability to throw food away than it is to donate it. And so, one of the projects that we've been working a lot on, mainly in emerging markets. Um, but but is thinking about how can the government incentivize food donation. So that could be very simple as saying, you know, as long as you do donate wholesome edible surplus in good faith, you won't be held legally liable for it. Um, you know, we have this in the United States. It's called the Good Samaritan Law. It's been in effect for many years now. It's never been challenged at the federal level. Um, so we know that it's something that works. The other thing is thinking about from a charitable perspective, can we be incentivizing donations, whether it be through product, you know, in, in some way through a tax system? Um, it's very interesting. So we're fortunate to serve food banks in more than 30 countries. And we have a couple of members based in countries where donors actually have to pay the value added tax when they provide surplus food. And you can only imagine the disincentive to a business to doing that um, because done correctly, you can actually incentivize businesses to donate product because you're reducing their landfill costs and they get all sorts of positive PR, right? Um, in theory around this. Um, so I think those two interventions, um, thinking about how do, we, how do we incentivize businesses and then make sure we have a policy environment that supports food loss reduction in part through donation are key. Fantastic. Aviva Michal, some thoughts about where um, some change would be most helpful? Certainly. Impactful. So I think um, in terms of the prevention end, you know, I work in the kind of dining and hospitality sector, which accounts for about 27% of food waste. Um, so really a, a, a significant amount. And there's been a lot of uh, interesting interventions happening really just around equipping um, food service professionals with the knowledge around how they could prevent. So providing them scales and systems that they're weighing the amount of food that they're wasting. And just simply by measuring the amount and seeing how much they're ordering that's going to waste has dramatically dropped the amount that people are ordering and thus wasting and encouraging people, encouraging those food institutions to then donate to local food um, hunger relief organizations. So I think there's a lot of promise in doing that more widely with really large food food institutions like hospitals, schools, um, and, and the like. Um, I think also in terms of, um, of course, obviously the processing and distribution that food bank shelters, soup kitchens do. Um, and then also on the policy end, you know, California, um, where we're based, is very progressive on this front. And about five years ago, passed some legislation that large food producers would have to divert that food either into compost or hunger relief or be fined pretty significantly. Um, and so while that is so wonderful, what we're seeing, what we saw over the last five years is that the infrastructure wasn't there yet for that, um, for that policy legislation. So there was not enough compost facilities in the, in the state to divert all of that food. So um, the state was scrambling, building compost facilities, coming up with um, extensions to the law and coming up with um, other ways of distributing to hunger relief organizations. So I think there's some really promising policy initiatives, but really just thinking through the um, infrastructure that has to be in place to do it successfully. Hmm. Michal, from the perspective of Israel. Great comments, Lisa and Aviva, and it's amazing how my, my three steps will be complementary to what you're saying. So I'll give three steps. One is to create new business models. And I would like to focus on the institutional caterings, which is whether it's what Aviva, you said, it's schools or hospitals or, you know, airplanes or, of course, places of work and all kinds of institutions which you every day are feeding many, many people. And we're looking at preventing the waste in the new models such as behavioral economy and design tools and so on and how they can create different environments that will make people eat less and also adjust to the new theme of less abundance and less, you know, 
the unneeded abundance. So that would be one. The second on a level of the consumer, I would say we want to promote a lot of food tech that will enter the kind of solutions that could help us in our daily life to really solve the issue. Like I'll give one example, a expiry date. How can we know the real expiry date of our product, not according to what was done you know, at the manufacturer level, but actually at our yogurt at our house? So how can food tech be part of it? How can we uh, cook on you know, different levels of cooking and use technology for that? So that would be the second uh, intervention level. And I will give uh, the third intervention level is to really work on the retail level and see how can we create a different pricing uh, solution that will be dynamic. It will be different when the different products are three days from their end, end, of, uh, end, of, the, um, end of life. And it will give a different uh, um, uh, pricing on the same day that they're, they're sold. So what we're trying to enter is a pricing that will be dynamic according to the uh, expiring date. And in that way, it's a win-win solution for everyone, for the supermarket, for the manufacturer, and for us that we can really buy it in different roles. So these are three interventions that are creating different business models and That's solutions. Fantastic. Thank you. I, I want to take a moment just to remind anyone listening that if you do have questions, there's a lot of topics. I know that I'm jotting a lot of notes. Um, please send them. We'll either get to them in conversation or we'll take a few minutes at the end to ask specific questions. Um, so uh, I heard three things that I want to tease out a little bit from, from your suggestions. One is the legal questions. And I know that we often um, at the Beard Foundation find chefs or restaurateurs who are worried about um, litigation or, or, I mean, we live in a litigious community society here um, of donating food that might cause some harm. And we heard about the Good Samaritan Act. So I would like to just spend a, a second going back to that. The second one, I think, is an important topic that the next half of our conversation will we'll get into, which is technology and technological solutions. And something I think we heard alluded to, the Hawthorne effect, where just the act of actually paying attention to waste and measuring it changes the amount of waste that one consumes and the aids that there are there. And then also, I'm going to add a tiny bit about the the um, sort of gastronomic perspective at the Beard Foundation. Um, I think we heard Aviva mention uh, that you um, work with the hospitality industry, and we actually created a curriculum called Creating a Full-Use Kitchen, which is um, supposed to in convey why working to minimize waste actually adds to the sort of spirit of gastronomy and cooking in a restaurant for all sorts of reasons, whether it's economic, whether it's looking at traditional uses, which always minimize waste because resources were so scarce, um, but also um, that minimizing waste actually starts before there is waste, when you're thinking about planning a restaurant, when you're trying to create a menu, when you're addressing purchasing. And so this multi-stakeholder um, approach throughout the system actually comes to play in the planning process to cook or, or shop or produce before you even get any food into your hands. So those, that's where we'll take the, the conversation in the next um, moment, um, next half of this this panel, and I just wanted to, again, if anyone has any questions, to please send them through the click link on the bottom of your screen, um, and we'll try to get to them. So let's start, actually, with um, the legality, because it's pretty straightforward here, but I, maybe we could explain a little bit more what the Good Samaritan Act is and why people don't have to, businesses don't, in particular, don't have to be nervous necessarily about donating waste or loss. Um, Perhaps, Lisa, we'll give that one to you. You brought it up. <laughs> so I should start by saying I am not a legal expert, so please <laughs> your legal counsel. Well, among us, you are. <laughs> <laughs> um, so yeah, so in the United States, uh, uh, we do have something called the Good Samaritan Act here, which essentially safeguards um, businesses, people, individuals, any entity from donating food uh, for charitable causes. And it says that as long as it's you're donated in good faith, um, that the donor does not carry the liability. God forbid something were to happen with, um, you know, around food safety or around resale or anything like that. And like I said, this has been in place now for many, many years, and it's never been challenged at the federal level. And it really kind of came about as a result of um, collaboration between Feeding America, which is the U.S. National Network of Food Banks, and uh, the Grocery Manufacturers Association of America at the time, where you saw a number of the business entities that were doing a lot of donation wanting to make sure they have that legal protection. Um, so this act uh, actually only exists in about seven, uh, seven countries 
globally, which is one of the big challenges. I will say that um, that Israel actually adopted this legislation. Uh, it would have been, gosh, I think late last year or earlier yeah. this year. So it's very progressive. Oh. And Cal can probably write more details on that. Sure. Um, <laughs> but but, I, one of the things I think of, I made that is interesting is that I don't think we always you know, policy or laws are not sexy. They don't, don't seem to, you know, want to, but, but they can be so supportive, especially in areas like this, where, where we need to be thinking creatively about legislation and policy as much as we are about what to do with stuff or how to act and get something done. So exactly. Why I think it's the one thing I will say too, Mitchell, though, in terms of an opportunity, I think from a philanthropy sector or from a, from a non-governmental investment sector is I think it's really important to make sure that, um, you know, as Aviva mentioned, if you're with this type of, to be able to have um, a, do, a strong donation policy, a Good Samaritan Act, you have to have a either a nonprofit or a secondary market that's able to handle a lot of different types of food. Look, food safety is the most important thing and prepared foods, for example, or perishable foods are the hardest types of foods to handle safely, especially in the recovery space. And so I think that from a philanthropy standpoint, a big area of opportunity is thinking about how do we equip the sector, whether it be food banks or other redistributors, to make sure they can handle safely these types of foods. So, you know, we think a lot about how do you make sure that you have cold chain at food banks, especially in some of these emerging markets where it's much more challenging, I think, to find resources. And uh, I think as Aviva pointed out, you know, um, how do you make sure that if you are handling prepared food, that it can be packaged and reprocessed in a way where it's truly edible and nutritious for the people in need. And Leket Israel, who's our partner in Israel, has an amazing model on this. I mean, they they redistribute thousands of meals, prepared mm -hmm. foods every day through a very innovative model. So I think from a from, like I said, from an investment standpoint, we have to make sure we have the ability in the redistribution space to handle the full the full slate of foods that are that are that can be recovered. Hmm. So, uh, as a subset of that, thank you very much for that explanation. Um, let's talk a, just a little bit about expiration dates, because I, I, I mean, I can vouch for my community of friends who, you know, won't even go to an expiration date. For sometimes they'll just throw it out two days before, just in case of what I don't know. But, but I think some of us think that they come, you know, that there's someone, some agency somewhere that's that's assigning them and putting them on things, and that they are rule and science and law. And so maybe can we talk? Perhaps maybe Aviva. Let's just about this about uh, what 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 the confusion is there, or what the opportunity is there. Let's say. Are you there? Unmute. Um, yeah. I think there is a lot of confusion and a lot of uh, a lot of trying to be oh extremely safe um, with our food. But as a lot of food banks um, really practice and know, is that the um, expiration date and um, is not necessarily the date that you can't eat it anymore. And for a lot of foods, there's a sometimes small or very large window of safety on the other side. So I think there's a lot of work on education for that piece as well. Um, one piece I wanted to also just bring up as an area that in working in this field and talking to a lot of other entrepreneurs who are looking at how can we um, continue to do this work at scale and sustainably. A lot of people are looking at social enterprise and there's a lot of legal gray area, at least in the States right now, around how do we take rescue donated products and look at reselling it as well. Um, and we've gone all the way up to the Harvard Food Policy um, Council and there's they're still unclear, but if you look at what we do in our, um, in our, in the world of, um, for example, donating clothes and then reselling them at, um, at thrift stores, there is this precedent for taking a lot of this surplus and using it as a social enterprise means. And that's an area that um, the food sector has not really um, touched, I think, again, out of a lot of that fear for, um, for the food safety. Hmm. Fascinating. Um, so maybe one moment, just about technology. We heard a reference um, within uh, within the restaurant community that there are certain technologies. But is what's the role that you see um, helping either put um, consumers in touch with with food or chefs in touch with um, surplus or, or where are there opportunities or or even existing um, startups or businesses for technology to play a part in this ecosystem of preventing food waste? Um, who wants 
Nahal, you're in Israel, a tech center. Does, does, do, do you include uh, technologists with, or startups within your ecosystem stakeholder work? Exactly. This was something that we worked last November. We saw that food tech is a huge issue in Israel, but at the same time, the, the issue is not addressing food waste at all. Almost no startups that are really addressing uh, solutions. I think, like I said previously, the solutions could be at different interventions along the system. It could be at the institutional caterings, at the grassroots level at our homes. It could be at different, you know, techniques and so on. And I think that there are a lot of opportunities. And Lisa was addressing further about what the philanthropy can do in order to help. So I can say that this is one thing that is really needed because in order to create the scene, the ecosystem that technology will enter, technology needs to know that there is a problem. We need to raise the awareness that there is a scene that is not explored. And then to create the opportunity and show the case, what is the business model that could be actually, you know, explored. And this is where I see in technology and also in other issues, whether it's business models or other areas of raising awareness where we need the philanthropic money in order to create the intervention point, raising the awareness, raising the case and showing that there is actually a problem because let's face it, we are talking here in this, you know, amazing panel but the problem is not yet even touched on so many levels of the problem and we have so much more work and we need to explore many so technology is one thing the dynamic pricing everything you touched we have so much more to say on what we we still need to do and i think that after we raise the business model and the awareness then the market will do by itself the different actions and and the legislation will work but we need to do a big step in order to you know the shift the paradigm so actually the market will be able to do it so it doesn't matter if what we need to work it doesn't matter we need to work from a policy level from a grassroots from a business and technology and involve all of them in order to really create a holistic systematic Mm. solution for the system because it's a system problem I think that's a great point. I'm going to come back to it because I think that there are some challenges in the philanthropic world for supporting system-wide work um, rather than sort of very tactical, immediate returns. And so I think that's an important point for us to come back to before we get there. Um, I wondered, say we had all these organizations working along the system, um, up chain, if you will, preventing waste in the first place, and they all succeeded. What does that do for the organizations? We have two major representatives um, that rely on waste, so to speak, or surplus um, to help address some of the issues, or is that just it's never going to be the world we're in and, and that's something we won't have to worry with? Because I, I in some ways, um, a lot of a lot of people like Janet Poppendick and some other thinkers um, feel like we institutionalize um, our responses to some social issues um, instead of solving them in some way. So I, I put that to you as perhaps a little bit of a philosophical question, Lisa and Aviva, to start. Sure. I'm happy yes. to, to, to respond first. I mean, first and foremost, the food banking model was created as a relief mechanism, and it was entirely created to be temporary, um, you know, because uh, in a perfect world, you would not be having charitable feeding as a key part of your long-term food system plan, right? right. Um, I mean, the main goal, I think, for all of us working at all points along the supply chain is say, how do we make sure that we have a, a, a system that isn't wasteful, but that ultimately is accessible to the people that need it most? Um, so that, you know, I think what Mikhail was saying about doing dynamic pricing, how can you be marking that, you know, those prices down, getting the prices as low as they can be. So you have people at all income levels that are able to access it. And how can we make sure we address the root causes, as Avita said, of poverty, right? Um, so that's the, the first and foremost thing. Um, the second thing is I think that especially given the size of the food loss and waste challenge that we're, we're faced with, the most important thing has to be prevention. I mean, I think um, in a perfect world, we're decades away from, from being in a place where, where we wouldn't have wholesome edible surplus to redistribute. Um, but, but if that were ever to be the case, I think that um, from the food banking perspective, you would see them entering probably the secondary market more so than, um, than just 
trying to add, we, we absolutely do not advocate for additional surpluses. Um, right. And the reality is, is that the majority of the food banks that we serve, um, more than two thirds of them are already doing purchasing at the wholesale level because they have to provide very nutritious food baskets to their clients. And a lot of times you're not able to get all of that donated, right? So you need to have a sure. Of, of product. So um, I think though one of the unique things that I love about the food banking model, why I love being part of this world, is that because you have a community-based food bank that tends to be serving all these different social service agencies in a community, whether it be homeless shelters, livelihood development programs, child care centers, senior centers, etc., you can use use that network to first of all know your clients really well why are people facing hunger on a daily or monthly basis and then be able to rally that network for advocacy for more pro poor policies and so um, and I think that's what we're seeing especially in the states you have beating America focused a lot on how they can support economic mobility um, how they can be advocating for these clients here so you're, you're ending the line not in shortening the line not just feeding the line and in, in other places as well you know that we all all want to be in this business for a short time um, and it's uh, uh, we want to be part of the solution of how do we make the system more sustainable and accessible for everyone thank you Aviva I know that you're working um, to shorten that line in the very use of the of the surplus and waste so a few thoughts about that yeah um, I think to that point um, we've we've built a system that's relying um, to a great deal on charitable causes and not looking at how does our government or systems across countries um, really provide that social safety net so that perhaps charities wouldn't have to. Um, I think there's much broader conversations that could be had around those um, how do we how do we ensure that people are not in situations where they need food assistance and again that's really talking wider level discussions around poverty alleviation and um, and really self-sufficiency as well. Mm -hmm. So I, I think much broader policy conversations. Of course. Um, so let's turn now to the specifics of philanthropy in this space. Um, uh, we've touched on it in a few places, um, you know, donors and um, other types of funders, institutional or private, um, have um, certain that there are trends there are things that um they are more interested in supporting or that they feel there's more return on investment and i feel like i'd like to ask each of you where you think the opportunity for biggest impact exists in this particular waste reduction ecosystem um, for the things that you wish were more appealing to the funding community or that would be helpful um, to accomplish your day-to-day -day work um, with support of some kind that isn't necessarily the uh, the most natural thing or the most obvious thing that appears. And maybe I'll start with you, Aviva, since you're on my screen mm -hmm. first. Um, I'd love to hear some thoughts for the, the this particular group of listeners um, that about what you think would be most uh, impactful. Sure. So I think that systems level work and supporting organizations like Michal's or in our area, the Food System Alliance that are bringing a lot of stakeholders. Um, small nonprofits like ours do not have a policy person. We do not have a um, agency collaboration person. We just do not have the bandwidth to do that kind of work. So funding the systems wide work, um, I, I think it's super critical. From a direct service organization, I think I can always speak to the need for um, funding people um, instead of funding stuff. I think that we've seen a tremendous amount of investment um, or grant opportunities for um, trucks and refrigeration and processing equipment. And that is wonderful and a piece of what we need. But if we don't have anyone to drive that drive those trucks or use those that piece of equipment, um, we're still a really far away from being able to do this work. Um, so I think it's that combination of really um, funding the technology and the equipment as well as the core operations to do the work. Great, thank you. Uh, Michal, thoughts, thoughts on the opportunity uh, for impact among funders, creative, innovative, or otherwise? Yeah. So I'll start, I think the foremost uh, and very important stage that the Philanatro, the money can enter is first on the system level, on bringing the ecosystem to the room, raise the awareness of the ecosystem that there is a problem and they need to be recruited. The second is to create leadership. 
we cannot solve each organization, whatever you know, funding they get, we cannot create a solution alone. So we need leaders in all the different places in the different sectors in order to do it. And in order to create the leadership, we need money to create this, you know, this environment of trust building and to work with those people and give them the opportunities. The third is to create business models. Today, there are no incentives for any business to enter, but if you show them and you have a case that are financed and you show from, you know, for the money that gets from the philanthropic uh, section, you get the money to create a business model, then you can come with something to the business and show, hey, look, there is an ROI. This is how it looks like. Enter with us to this, you know, to this project. And the, fur and the last one I would say, in order to create the awareness building. Awareness building is something that you need to always work. You need to create a lot of alternatives. We're talking about 17 different kinds of reasons that people waste in their houses. So you need to give 17 different alternatives. We need money in order to show in a positive way how the alternatives could look like. So I would say that as much as possible on the seed money, on the alternatives, on the upstream level, will very much work in order to change the system. Hmm. Great. Lisa, from your point of view, where well, would the most impactful funding opportunities exist? Sure. Well, I think of Eva and Mikhail, I want to say I fully support their analysis as well, that the system level work, which is going to be, it's, it's, it's a hard road to hoe, right? It takes perseverance. It's, going to, it's a multi-year effort. So I think that um, donors that recognize that and are willing to support that are very visionary, um, but it's definitely patient capital <laughs> for sure. Um, the second thing, I mean, just just food is inherently local. It's a global issue, but it's a local. So I'm sure everyone participating in this webinar um, and the people that will watch it afterwards, you can turn in your local community and find some way to be involved in a system, whether it be, you know, redistributing surplus product to those in need or something really innovative like Aviva's doing that looks more at the social enterprise piece. So I would encourage local investment just because that can be such a change agent for an investment at any size. But the other thing I would just encourage, and obviously I'm biased, kind of being more of a, at a global direct service organization, um, is that even though other places around the world may feel very far away, they're struggling with the same issues that we face with, you know, daily in our in our communities. And so, um, so I think that especially around, um, if we're serious about, you know, doing redistribution, thinking about how do we equip what currently is a charitable sector um, to make sure they can receive the full range of, of foods that are both nutritious that need to be distributed, whether they're perishable or unperishable. Um, and so that's one piece that I think we've seen a lot of great return on. Sure. Hmm, interesting. Um, now, maybe uh, from each of you, because I know whenever anyone's listening to a social action conversation, they want to know what they individually should be doing, you know, at the next cocktail party or the next time they're in the grocery store in the line and they see something, what they want to say, how they can all become advocates and ambassadors for reducing food waste. Do you, is there something that either you personally um, change the way you shop or the way you cook or what you think about what you're going to do? Uh, I'm just curious if you have something that the folks listening can take away to just do tonight. Anyone? Aviva, yeah. you're, yeah. you're moving up to the, <laughs> the camera. Um, I, I think there's certainly ways that we can kind of adjust how we're looking in the grocery store even um, as consumers. Um, and I find myself, you know, I created an entire organization about reducing food waste. And sometimes I look at a peach, I'm like, mm, it's a little too soft. I don't think so. But really thinking about how a lot of this product is perfectly edible, perfectly nutritious, and we're going to enjoy it if you just peel that outer layer off. So I think even thinking about how we, um, how we look at foods as a consumer, and then also for anyone who's doing a large catered event function um, in many cities and states across the country, there are organizations that you can call and say, hey, we're having a benefit and or a party and we're going to have leftovers. Can you come by at nine and pick it up? And as simple as that phone call, there's in so many cities, the infrastructure that they will pick that food up and get it to the people who need and you don't have to do the packaging and redistribution. So, um, yeah, as simple as looking up those organizations and making that call. And I'll just add, uh, because of I, I know who's some of the folks who are listening, I would say if you are planning an event, as we do at the James Britt Foundation, over 400 a year, you can ask the people who are the caterers or whatever what their plan is for waste, and just asking that question leads to some mm -hmm. change in the answer. Michal, 
Um, what, what would you tell folks to do tonight or tomorrow or the green market on the weekend? An exciting opportunity would be to look at how, take a week and see how you are approaching food, what you're buying, how you are storing, how, what you're cooking and how you're using. We found in our, you know, in our research that everyone said, okay, don't come to our houses. We're very ecological. We don't waste anything. You don't need to enter our house. And we wanted to enter houses and see how people react and actually behave. And at the end of the week, surprise, everyone saw that they were wasting so much more than they thought that they're very furious at it and they really want to create change. So I would say not what exactly each one of us can do, but just take a week, look at things and see where you can change your behavior. Right. Fantastic. Well, I want to leave a few minutes for our folks, uh, Lauren, Tamar, and Charlene, to close us out. I want to thank you all. Um, such an interesting conversation, so much more to talk about. But I think the, the awareness, the mindfulness piece, um, both that this is an issue, that it's an issue that doesn't just affect um, us individually, but is part of a larger system that requires some attention from the philanthropic community, from the individual action community, from the policy community, and the social work that we all do. Um, I can't thank you enough for being part of this conversation and illuminating me. Um, I'll uh, ask Lauren, I think, is going to send us off. I'll I'll be happy Sorry? to do it, and I'll okay. um, just to do it quickly because we have three three minutes as of now, and also then to folk to turn it over. I think Tamar was going to give a um, closing from JFN. Well, the main thing I want to do is just thank our tremendous panel and Aviva, Lisa, Michal, and in particular Mitchell. You have been just an extraordinary moderator and. Be careful, because when you do a good job, you might get recruited <laughs> to do more. It's sometimes it is a, that's an honor, a, a, you know, contagious, um, or at least. Um, and we're so, so grateful that each of you, it's kind of hard when you can't see the eager audience that's behind you, that's behind us. But I know that people are really, really grateful. We're also going to be happy we recorded this and we're going to be sharing this with the entire membership. Um, some of we're going to be putting together some of the um, tips in particular that were given at the end around how philanthropy can really make a difference and sending out some follow up as well as some additional resource materials. And I want to thank a couple of you that submitted while we were on the call some ideas for the, that follow up. And um, with that, I will wish everybody a Gemar Fatima Tova, an easy and um, meaningful Yom, Yom Kippur and holiday season. Another thank you to our panelists. And Tamar, did you want to say something from the Jewish Funders Network side? Yes, thank you. I just want to echo the, the appreciation for all of you coming together to put this panel together. It was fascinating and so interesting and I believe really can lead to a lot of action. And I want to thank all the participants who were on the line and let them know that they can, of course, reach out to me to, if they have questions for any of the panelists, if they want the, the link to the video, and also with other ideas, um, because we definitely want to, as, as I think it was stated in the beginning and in the invite, we want to continue bringing people together to discuss this important issue. So I'm here to help facilitate that. So please feel free to reach out to me with any ideas and um, questions. And also, Gamar Tov, everybody, and thank you all. Thank, thank you. Bye-bye.